Thank you, guys. Um, so I'm, I'm here as a veteran of the word problem wars. We are all veterans of the word problem wars. Um, if you teach math, you're on one side of that war. If you are not a math teacher, you are at one point a math student, which puts you on a different side of the word problem war. And what occurs to me is that we've basically declared a draw in the war on word problems. We accept that our students won't ever like them, but we hope that with enough practice and competence and encouragement, they'll get good at them and maybe won't hate them. Uh, that's a, about as far as uh, our ambition extends with word problems. And I think that's a shame, it's, it's too bad. Like the, the, the draw here, I think a lot of us are, are comfortable with that. So has it been, so shall it always be. Uh, we've been locked in this draw for as long as I've been a teacher, certainly uh, probably much, much longer. But the draw has been driving me crazy because I think I understand what word problems are trying to do and I get it and I, I respect it immensely. As far as I can tell, word problems are trying to do two things. Every word problem wants to do two things at once. One of those is to uh, tell students that math models your world, which is a huge claim, a bold claim, uh, that no one should just believe on its face. But math, word problems say to kids that you, you have questions, math has answers. You have things that interest you, math can make them more interesting. You, you have problems, math has solutions. It's a huge claim. And then also, word problems try to tell students that, that we can show you how to use math as a powerful force in your own life to get things done. Big claims. I'm sure we'd all agree these are, these are worthy, honorable goals. I'd love to unpack them just a little bit more um, and try to, try to figure out why they go so wrong, particularly what paper has done to those two promises that we make, kids, uh, make to kids and what we can do to fix them. But before we do that, this is just an example of what I mean by math models your world, that math can help you solve problems. This is uh, from Twitter. If you don't know what Twitter is, you're probably doing okay. Don't worry about that. But this is a friend of mine who tweeted out uh, the following statement here. And we're all teachers. Uh, we go to more than our fair share of graduations. Okay, so we, we understand the sentiment behind this tweet. Uh, graduations can be long, slow affairs, sometimes dull. Um, but I, I, this tweet here gives me some, some goosebumps because, I mean, check this out. Like, she is not a math educator or a mathematician. She is, by all accounts, a normal, well-adjusted human being. And what she's done here is she's taken a problem that bugs her, selected the correct mathematical model to describe it, rates, and applied that model correctly to get an answer. I mean, I just, I step back and say, like, what more do I want from my students who aren't going to go on to, to do STEM careers? This girl gets that math is a model and she knows how to work it, okay? So here's what happens now is that as someone who design, as people who design tasks for students, we see this and we say, all right, we want to get this in front of our students, this, this exhilaration and empowerment that she feels right here. We want to get some fraction of that in front of our students so they can experience it, okay? So we take a piece of paper and we start to write. And I, I want to be fair to the process here. I've done this numerous times, okay? I'm not trying to be cynical or, or unfair to it, but here's how I see this going down. As we try to take that experience from out there and put it in front of our students in here, is we start with a piece of paper. And we've got to select some kind of visual, some kind of a photo or whatever to describe this scene, to set the context. So I don't know, like that right there maybe. Uh, but there's a lot of these problems, so it can't be too expensive. So maybe that's a little too expensive there. So something kind of, kind of cheap, right? I mean, uh, that'll get them going. Then we go into the text of the problem here, and we write down all the information they're going to need to solve it. And then we tell them what to do with that information, the question. And we jump to the end of the book, and we write the answer down, uh, and it works out exactly. I'm not trying, to be, uh, not trying to set up a straw man here that I can then knock down over the next few minutes here. This is a, as fair as I can be to the process. I have done this before um, in my classes, but it's just so striking to me that what was kind of exhilarating for her, like, wow, um, I got this, is now a bit, I don't know, boring? Is that fair to say? Um, what was once empowering for her, like, wow, I have this incredibly powerful tool in my back pocket I can pull out and solve problems at any time, what was empowering for her is now a little bit intimidating. I mean, I'm a math educator. I feel a little bit intimidated by the presentation of that problem. The words kind of hit me in the face a little bit. I'm like, all right, well, let me get my bearings here. Um, how did that go so wrong? I mean, you saw what I did. You saw the steps I took. They all felt natural, taking this experience out there and putting it on, on paper in here. All those steps felt natural to me, and yet it went so weird. 
I've had a really hard time figuring out what went so wrong and how to fix that. But I've, I've come to some, uh, some conclusions here, okay? I have, in fact, I have, I have a metaphor to help explain to myself what went so wrong there, all right? So I, I, I beg for your patience as I explain why what you just saw there is very similar to a bad movie, okay? Uh, a bad story. I see, I see in, in good stories, good movies, I see good math problems. And in bad math problems have their uh, correlation in bad movies. And if you'll just suspend your disbelief, which I totally get, um, for just two minutes here, I'll explain why. This right here is a movie, in fact. This is a one frame, one photo of the, of the screen every minute, all stitched together top to bottom. Does anybody know what movie this is? <laughs> is that unreasonable to ask? I picked a movie that I figured most of us had seen in here. Oh, I'm serious. <laughs> we got some kind of uh, tan, uh, tan stuff up at the top there. Some darker business down below. A few flashes of light. Yeah, Star Wars. Thanks for that. This is Star Wars right here, okay? Now, here, here's the important part about movies and stories is that they, they have three acts. They unfold over three acts. So Star Wars, for instance, uh, act one here goes up until Luke's uncle and aunt are killed, and then it takes a jump. The story moves. Then in act two goes up until the final assault on the Death Star, and the story jumps again. And then act three goes up until the credits. Each of these acts has a, a particular job to do in the movie, and you'll find all of them in good and bad math problems. Good movies will track on the good math problems, bad on the bad, okay? Here's the first shot from Star Wars. Let's see if we can draw a parallel here. Here we go. It's like a math problem, right? You get it. Uh. If you want to walk out, I get it. All right, look, let me show you two other clips from movies you've seen, and we'll see if we can find a pattern here. Okay, so uh, holler the name out when you know it. anything in common with those three? What's that? John Williams. All three? You're right. You get a prize. But <laughs> you, get a, you get a half full bottle of water. <laughs> that's all I brought. <laughs> uh, yeah, great call. John Williams. Uh, that's exactly right. Not particularly useful for our purposes here, though I'm, my, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm imagining John Williams in my math classroom serenading the class with lousy math problems and thinking that could work, that could work. Uh, what else do you see here? You want to know more. You want to know more. There's a, an element of the unknown, of suspense. Um, it intrigues you, entices you, draws you in. Yeah. What else? There's movement. Yeah, very uh, intentional use of movement. I'm going to fish for a few seconds more. Good versus evil. There's a clear villain uh, in a lot of these. Even though it's un uh, like in the first shot in Star Wars, there's a clear villain. Huge Goliath ship pounding the small one. There's an unseen villain in, in Jaws, but you kind of know that we're, like, who, who is, whose point of view is looking at this lady swimmer from below there? Yeah. Uh, I mean, these are very successful movies, right? These are successful movies not just uh, where I come from, the U.S. of A., but also in your land, Canada, and in, in, other, <laughs> in other countries where they don't speak English as a first language, which is really odd. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a, not an easy thing to create a movie like this that's successful in Beijing, let's say. How are these movies all so successful everywhere? Like, what do you notice here? It's all visual, is what I notice also, is that there's, there's no words really here, you know? I mean, there's no narrator droning about how Indiana Jones is cool and confident and good with a whip. Like, there's no, there's no words like that. 
it's, it makes very good use of visual. No one is droning on about how uh, you know, good versus evil in Star Wars. You get it because there's this huge ship and the visual is set up so it goes over the camera forever and ever and ever, setting up the stakes of the movie in one shot, which might take me a paragraph to talk about here, a few minutes to talk about here. There's, there's such very good use of visuals, very few words. I got I to gotta point to that in particular in act one of these movies. Also important is our hero here in Jaws. He has a job to do, okay? All of our heroes have a job to do. This guy's hero, uh, a job, when he doesn't do it, uh, he goes to sleep that night, he wakes up next morning and says, oh my gosh, I gotta do this job. This job goes through the entire movie. What is this guy's job? Yeah, right, kill the shark. Like it's, and this is amazing to me. It's three words, three words that summarize 90 minutes of movie, okay? It's three words that propel the entire thing that keep you glued to your seat. Just three words. So you've been very patient. I appreciate that. Let's jump back to the math, okay? Now, now my friend here, she had a first act. She had an act one. It was visual. It was multi-sensory. The boredom was not something that she read about. It was something that hit her in the gut and provoked her to, to take on a job. What was her job? What was her hook? What question is she trying to answer here in three words, four words? Like, like how, when am I going home? How long? Two words. Uh, you know, when will this end? Yeah, like very, she, she, had, she had a very clear job to do, and it was one of the first things she experienced, and the multi-sensoriness of the whole graduation was what provoked it for her. Now, there's an act one here also. Where do you find the act one here? I mean, there's a, there's a visual, certainly. It's, it's also boring, but not in the same way. Not in the kind of boring way that provoked her to do some math. that's boring in the way that kind of shuts me down. And then there's also the job, the hook that, the, that the, the student has to do. Where do you find the hook here? Where's the kill the shark moment? Yeah, it's at the very end, which is curious. I, if you're a math teacher here, I don't think you care about that. I certainly haven't for a very long time because I'm very good at these kind of problems. Most, ma most math teachers, I imagine, are very, very comfortable with this kind of structure. But try to think about this. The student has to read through the whole problem and only figures out what she's doing at the very end. That's a little bit strange. It's unlike what my friend did at the graduation when the hook was the very first thing she thought about. Um, but also, I mean, think about you watching a movie, and you're in this movie, um, and for 80 minutes, you have no idea why anybody on the screen is doing anything they're doing. And then in the last 10 minutes, it all becomes clear. That'd be kind of strange for you. You might have a movie in mind that you watched that was like this, that you never want to watch again, that you might have walked out of, because it was just too strange and foreign. I'll submit to you guys, I think we're doing that with students right here, students who aren't comfortable with this structure here, by putting that question, that hook, at the very end. That's act one. Uh, here's just one more act one visual. I show this now and then. I, I think it's one of, the, one of the better ones that I've made. I, I like this one because um, I play this short four-second visual, three-second visual, and it provokes a hook, a kill of a shark, very naturally. I could ask you the question, will the ball go in? But most of you will already, were already wondering it. The visual is that well set up. Um, some of you guys might be wondering like, how high is the ball above the ground or something, and um, we're happy you're here. But most of us perhaps are, <laughs> most of us I think are wondering the same question. So I'll ask you right now to guess. I just wanna see a hand up real fast. Do you think the ball's going in? Toss a hand up if the ball's going in. Okay, and just look around, make sure you see who raised their hand for what. All right, so no one is uh, going back on this later. Um, and the rest of you guys think the ball's not going in, and we'll find out, but I just want that on the record. So act two is a little bit tricky. Act two is hard to explain for me. Act two is where the hero gets the tools, information, and resources to handle the job from act one. So in this shot right here from Star Wars, you see all of that. Uh, you got uh, tools, the lightsaber, resources, your friends, the ship, the robot, the Wookiee. Uh, information you need, the force, okay? All this is useful for him um, as he's trying to solve his task. Uh, and I just gotta point out that in this scene here, in this scene here, we have a very effective lecture in Obi-Wan Kenobi. Lecture is very easy for us to, uh, to down talk in groups like this right here, like, oh, lecture bad all the time. But lecture is good in some situations. I mean, I, I am lecturing here, and thus far, no one's left the room, so that's a, a, an encouraging sign for me. So lecture is clearly good in some situations. 
we need to figure out when is lecture good and for what purposes here. So Obi-Wan Kenobi lectures nonstop. All he does is lecture, the entire movie through. Remember, a Jedi can feel the Force flowing through him. Your eyes can deceive you, don't trust them. Stretch out with your feelings. Use the Force, Luke. I would encourage you to think about why, why does no one walk out of the room when he starts lecturing? Like, what's the secret sauce here that makes his lectures good? I mean, I think part of it is that the act one has been so well set up. Here's, a, here's an act one right here. Luke is tired of getting shot in the butt by that robot artichoke thing. Remember this? Shoots lasers at him. He's tired of it. It hurts, okay? I'm not advocating hurting our students by any means, by the way. It's on, <laughs> on tape. Um, so, but he, he's ready. He has an act one now. How do I stop getting hurt by this thing is his, his, his hook, his kill the shark moment here. I need to stop getting hurt. So then he's ready for a lecture. Obi-Wan Kenobi has the information that will help him stop getting hurt. He wants that information. Um, what Obi-Wan Kenobi doesn't do is walk onto the deck of the ship that morning and write on the board, standard 13.4, proper lightsaber usage, do three examples, and then assign 20 practice problems to Luke. Is the difference clear? There's no act one in the one case. There is an act one in the other. The lecture here is in response to a burning desire, a task that Luke has. I mean, there's other situations where you don't need to lecture. You know, this guy right here, he does not need your lecture. He'd prefer you didn't lecture. He can crack the code himself. He can make his own tools. Some tasks, situations, and students lend themselves better to an approach where students just do stuff. Figuring out when, when to use one versus the other is a task for a career, as far as I can tell. Figuring out uh, when's the right time to tell is a career-long question, not an hour-long question here. But I just want to be sensitive to both those cases. And when you're going to lecture, make sure it's in response to a need the student has. So here, my friend, she had an act two. Okay? She needed information to answer her hook, to figure out her job. What information did she need? She's got the names, yeah, how many names per minute? And she's got that here. There's a missing piece, though, then. Eight names per minute. And then how many total names? Thank you. How many? So those two things she needed. She had the job to do. When will this end? She went out and got information. Now, how did she get that information? How do you suppose she got eight names per minute? Like some, some textbook deity in the sky handed her that figure? No, how did she get that? Probably timed it out, the eight names per minute. Like just said, all right, I am super bored and I'm just gonna start timing. So she timed out maybe a minute worth of names, you know, maybe 30 seconds worth of names and then got that rate. And then how did she get the total number of, of names in the, in the whole graduation? You know, she probably counted heads in the crowd, maybe? Program. So think about what you'd do. Yeah, the program. And she counted names there. They're all laid out like that. So she went out and she got the info she needed. And then what tools did she need? She needed info. She got it. She needs tools now, though. Mathematical tools. Her lightsaber, in this case, was rates, was proportions, was using rates to figure out an answer. That's her act, too. And notice how starkly different it is for that act two right there, how different that is. Here it tells you the information that you need and it gives it to you. It tells you you need rate and total names and doesn't ask you to think about how you would get the, that information if you were there at the graduation. It just gives it to you. Like, I'm not sure how well this is preparing students for real challenges they'll face in their life after graduation. It does so much for them, it's very helpful. That's act two. Um, you can see it all right here. Again, like in this case, uh, you've got that information, uh, the, you know, the height of the net, the length of the court, all that stuff is given to the student. The student does not have to think about how she would get it. Right here, what, uh, what tool could we use? What tools could we use to figure out will the ball go in? We have a question, we want the answer to it. What tools, you're my math teacher, what tools can you offer me that'll crack that open? Symmetry. Symmetry is a mathematical property you can offer me as my teacher that will help me answer the question that I want to answer. Great. And then once symmetry has been exhausted and I'm great with symmetry, you might dial back the basketballs a little way. 
So I can't, I can't just mirror it. I don't know where the, the, the apex of it is. If that was the case, what then? What tool would you offer me? What concepts are useful here, if any? Angle of trajectory, mm -hmm. and the, the speed of the release there, yeah, certainly. Uh, that would lead us to projectile motion and quadratic equations. These are all tools that sometimes we just, we come into class and we say, all right guys, here's the tools. We lecture about them, give them practice problems. I'm suggesting this is, works much better if they have a reason for applying those tools like this right here. Um, there's also technological tools like a, like a GeoGebra or Sketchpad where you can adjust the parameters of a projectile of a quadratic equation and say, all right, what do each of these things do? You move them around and see like, oh, okay. I mean, math, math says it's going in. Do we believe math? Math says you should believe math, but I don't know if I trust math, okay? So right here we have that, and we have this equation down there, and I mean, it's perfectly valid to talk about what those numbers mean. Does anybody in here have an idea of what 14.56 uh, means? What that could possibly mean? Maximum value, 14.56 meters, seems a little bit high. Not it's feet, you guys know me too well here, yeah. 14.56 feet is, a, is the highest point that the ball hits there. And t negative 10.98, what does that mean? That's a little trickier. It's how far away from my feet it hits that apex there. I mean, math is explaining something here. Uh, you know, uh, the, the junior high basketball hoop in, in the U.S. is 19 feet from the three-point line and 10 feet tall. So do I put 19 in for X and get 10 out for Y? Or do I put 10 in for X and get 19 out for Y? These are all really effective, good Act 2 questions, especially in response to a compelling Act 1 that we just set up, not as something that I lecture about from the start of class. So, um, yeah, it turns out uh, Act 3 here is a lot easier to explain. Act 3 is where we resolve things. It's where uh, we have the end of the movie, the cathartic moment, the ah, the good guy wins, the bad guy loses, whatever. Like in, uh, in you have the, the Lost Ark is found. We have Jaws is blown up. The Death Star is blown up. And if you guys are planning on watching any of these movies later, if you hadn't seen these already, I just apologize tremendously <laughs> for having spoiled these. These are from the 70s, though, so I hope, you know, it's no excuse, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, my friend here, she had an act three, okay? She had an act three. She was in suspense. She made these calculations. It's one o'clock. Her math says that it's over in 36 minutes, so she's looking at her watch, waiting for 1.36 p.m. to roll around, and she's in suspense. She's wondering, is this going to work? My teachers all said this would work. Is this going to work? Um, it's not Jaws-level suspense. I'm not claiming that. But it's similar. And then once 134 rolls around and the graduation ends, she has that moment of, ah, right. This thing does work. It's cathartic. It's the resolution of her movie there. There's also um, an Act 3 right here. Where's the act three in this problem? Where is its resolution? Yeah, you saw us already. It's in the back of the book. Now, we're chuckling a bit, but I really want to nail why this is a bit uh, comical. Why this is comical. I mean, think about the promises we made. We made promises. Math models your world. Math works. We'll show you how. We've made these promises, and this is how we back it up. I mean, for one, it's just... It's not a bombastic ending to this movie. Like, I mean, check out the, uh, the end of Star Wars. You're all clear, kid. Now let's blow this thing and go home. <laughs> I mean, it's just kind of a letdown a little bit, you know? Like, it should be, but instead it's like, so, I mean, there's that element of it where I want to I show the answer in, in as much uh, bombast as I possibly can. Um, but then there's also this bit right here where this is a, you guys know who this is? This is a Billy Mays, may he rest in peace. He, he sold hundreds of products on late, late, late night TV after I was long in bed. Like this one right here, he's, he's telling you, he's making a big promise to you um, that this product, OxyClean, will take red wine stains out of white carpet which no one in here should believe, okay? 
That's a way bigger claim than math models your world, okay? This is, this is a serious sales pitch. So what's he gonna do? You're skeptical as well, you should be. What's he do? Does he open up uh, you know, the OxyClean sales handbook and opens it up to page 32 and says, check this out guys, it says right there, it takes red wine stains out of white carpet. Believe me, it says it right there. Like you might find that to be a conflict of interest. You might find that to be an unsatisfying sales pitch. You know what you wanna see. You wanna see him prove it, right? So he does. Very effective sales pitch uh, for this product called OxyClean. So how do we, how do we sell the product of math here. I mean, you guys have seen in, in, in this problem right here, you guys saw that the, uh, the math says it goes in. And yet, I mean, 90% of you do not think the ball is gonna go in when I asked you for a guess, okay? And even if you are a math teacher here, you're, you know that these models have some strange warranties on them. I mean, if wind comes into the mix here, it, it, our models get thrown off. If the ball drifts to the side, the model gets thrown off. You guys know that our models, our product, are a little bit finicky. So I'm telling you, guys, math works. The ball goes in. You guys are saying, I don't know if I believe you. I don't know if I believe that math works like that. So what do I, as your teacher, what should I do to prove it to you? You guys know what you want to see. <laughs> it's just not going to work for you. You just want to see the ball going in. It's okay to clap. It's okay to clap. <laughs> Feel like clapping, clap. My 17th try there. So um, there's one last part of this, one last part. What does this shot serve? What purpose does this shot serve right here? Sets up a sequel, sets up the next movie, okay? So if we're gonna commit to this process of opening up mathematical modeling to our students even a little bit, be prepared for some students to finish up sooner than others. So in those instances, I always try to have a sequel in my back pocket, a problem that will extend the first problem, make it a little bit harder and richer for students who need more challenge, have a sequel on hand. I mean, that right there, that's the entire three acts. And you've been very patient through a strange metaphor. I didn't come here with this metaphor because I thought it was cute or funny or fun. It's literally the best thing I have to explain to myself why my students didn't like modeling before and didn't buy the sales pitch that math models their world. And now they do, not 100%, but more than before. It's the best metaphor I have. And it's led to some of the best work of, of my career teaching. And so there's, here's five things that I drag out of that metaphor, five rules of thumb that I, I, I tell myself as I design tasks for students. And the most important, the most cost effective is get to the hook quickly. I mean, I'm not recommending you do everything that I, I demonstrate here all day, every day, but pieces of this can be pulled out and are very effective. One of those is getting to the hook very quickly. Here's an example, a teacher sent me this worksheet here. I was really grateful for her sending me stuff. Um, it was, it's very interesting here. This worksheet uh, has the, the, the census data. It asks you for your home, state, and county on the left side of the page, and your home, state, and the county to the west of the county you live in on the right side of the page. And it's asking you for census data, uh, birth rate, number of people above the age of 18 in both counties. That's great, right? Census data, we can all get behind that, real world data. Goes on for another page here. On the next page, you have more stats. Um, people over the age of 18, the death rate, uh, all these sort of things on both sides there. Okay. Goes on for an, another page. And I gotta point out that it's only here in the last sentence of the last line of the last page that we encounter the kill the shark moment, the hook of this problem. In which county would you rather live? Which I think is a great hook as good if not better than kill the shark, or how, how long will this graduation last? That's a great question that math can inform. But how many students will ever get to that hook? How many students will hit halfway down page two and the bell's gonna ring and they'll never understand why they were doing that work? And ask yourself, how, how costly is it to drag that hook to the start of the problem? How much do you lose? How much do you gain? I mean, think about this. You come into class that day, the bell rings, and you say, guys, you're going to turn 18, and it's going to kill me, but you're going to be able to leave this town and leave me or stay here. I don't know. I don't know what you want to do. In what county do you want to live when you grow up? And just like that, the hook is out there. And then we bring stuff, 
bring facts and figures into play to help it out in Act 2. We bring in the information. Uh, do you want to live somewhere where there's lots of girls, lots of guys, lots of babies to babysit, lots of money being made? We bring those stats in to serve this question, in which county would you rather live? Notice how simple that inversion was right there. We just flipped it, and now they know why they're doing all this stuff. I mean, it goes on and on like this. Open up any page in any textbook, and you find this everywhere. Where's the hook here? Where's the kill of the shark? What are we doing here? If you're reading this straight through, you're likely bored at this point. Maybe you know to look towards the end of the problem, though, and you're still scanning. This is kind of a tragedy, though. The hook here is kind of awesome. It's said in 26 words, though, which is a shame. We can probably tighten this up, put it in more humane language, like how people speak. Like, how could we phrase this in a way that didn't take 26 words? How deep is the well? Nice. How deep is the well? Five words. Like, we have saved a ton. Bring that to the front of the problem. How deep is the well? Because, I mean, this is such a cool thing. Like, right here, the, the fact that, uh, you know, uh, I got friends, college-educated, smart people. If you drop a rock in a well and they hear the sound of the splash, they'll think one of three things. Like, that's not very deep. That's deep. Or, wow, that's deep. That, 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 that's the extent of their analysis. <laughs> That's as good as they can do. But if you know that math models your world and how to use that model, like we can get to a pretty scary degree of accuracy how deep that well is. I want that for my students. I want them to know that power. But I could not come up with a better way to scare them away from that power than this problem right here. So get that hook to the front. Get to it as quickly as possible. And ideally, make that first act visual. If we're describing the world, make it visual when possible. So, I mean, in, in uh, this instance right here, can you conceive of a visual that I could show you that would make it very natural for me to ask the question, how deep is the well? Like, what kind of visual would you watch up here that would make that question seem very natural, that would occur to you naturally? Can we conceive of one? What's that? Seen from Lassie. Seen from Lassie. Seen from Lassie, like I'm wondering how deep, how deep is that kid down there? Uh -huh. So you drop a rock down that well where the kid is, like a big rock. <laughs> and, uh, that's, Lassie was a clever dog. Yeah, I mean, there's people out there, like you say, that are like Hollywood makes these visuals for us sometimes. Uh, I'll say it, it could be even simpler than that, like just find a deep well and drop a rock in it and film the thing. I mean, YouTube's done that for us. I mean, some of you guys are like, like, that reaction, I want that for my students. I want them to see that and feel that, like, whoa, how deep is that? Do you feel how natural it is for me to ask the question, how deep is that? I could ask you for a guess right now. How deep do you think that is? Guessing is a great way to bring in students who don't experience success traditionally in math class. You can get the closest guess without being the best at using the operations. How deep do you think it is? 50 feet? I'm sorry. Five meters? 50 meters? <laughs> um, a uh, kilometer. <laughs> Digging so deep. Yeah, so we can guess at it, and then check this out. Look what I can do here. I'm going to ask you guys to watch that again and uh, raise your hand when the rock hits the ground. Would you do that for me? Raise your hand when the rock hits the ground. Ready? I mean, I, I definitely, I, I, there's a, an early group that I think raised their hand when it hit the side of the well. I think I get that one. Hit, hit the sides twice, banks off twice. But then I was either really early or you were really late. That's interesting. Let me, let me suggest this. Let me suggest that you guys answered a different question perfectly. You guys have the right answer to a different question. Does anybody know the question that you guys answered perfectly? When did you, when did the sound hit? When did, when did you hear the rock hit the ground? 
So some of you guys are having this moment right now, like, oh, okay. So we, we've introduced a, a really crucial part of this problem, the speed of sound, in a way that's felt very natural, a little bit enticing and kind of curious. Whereas the problem that you saw buried that concept in a paragraph of text. With visuals we can, and, and, and audio, especially here, we can illustrate concepts in ways that feel natural. If we restrict ourselves to paper, we have to write about what was an, an oral experience, which is strange, it's unnatural. Paper is the limiting factor here. Multimedia has freed this classroom experience in a really nice way. Um, Hollywood does this for us sometimes. You ready, Sean? Yeah, go ahead. Three, two, one. Two, um, almost three. So he's calculating, can you help him out, kids? You know, like that, we can start the problem that way, if need be. Um, this right here, like, I don't know. Uh, using visuals has had a weird effect on my classes. I can't describe it fully, but here's some examples. It has this effect on students. Like, I, I gave this to a, a colleague of mine, this exact image, and he, he and his students did the symmetry, and they figured out that the ball goes in, and he got what he wanted out of the problem, and he was ready to move on. But his students, like, they didn't, I didn't give him the answer image like I showed you guys. And so they threw this kind of miniature revolt. They were unhappy. <laughs> they were unhappy they didn't know the end of the math story, the math problem. Um, another teacher reports that his student was saying, it's killing me, I've got to know. Does the ball go in? Now, I don't know, maybe this kid's just a really motivated math enthusiast. I don't know, maybe he says this about every math problem. But I know that in my practice, I haven't had that same reaction when I pose problems on paper. Like, I've got to know what the answer is in the back of the book. I've got to know. That's been a very rare, I'd say non-existent experience for me. <laughs> this right here, uh, you might have seen this, this visual before. It, this is tedious. This is boring right here. And yet, a teacher reports that like, his students were watching this, and you would have thought it was a summer blockbuster, he said. The way they were watching this thing fill up. Um, another teacher has said that it's, it's so boring, it's engaging, which, <laughs> like I said, there's a lot I don't understand about how visuals work with math modeling, but it, I, this is the result that I want, this kind of engagement. It's killing me, I've got to know. I try to separate the first two acts. When you're dealing with paper, you can't have two pages per problem. You can't do it. Books are already expensive and heavy. So what we do is we compress Act 1 and Act 2. We show the context, and we give all the information, tools, and resources to solve it on the exact same page. That's unnatural, as we saw with my friend in the graduation. It also freaks kids out. So like in this right here, what you're seeing is you've got the Act 1, the question, and the context. But then also on top of that, you've got all the tools, all the information, all the resources. We've got to separate those whenever possible. Pose the question, then ask kids, what info do you need here? What resources do we need here? Let me help you get those. So uh, in this instance here, I like the students to help create the second act. So this right here, this is uh, from a Canadian textbook, I believe. I'm, I'm told this is, from, uh, this is for remedial students on a vocational track. This is for students who have typically not had a lot of success or enjoyment in math. I don't know, guys. So notice here, again, that we've got the same problem with Act 1 being all the way at the bottom there. Did she order enough boards? But check out Act 2, this imposing block of text that dispenses all this information they'll need. All I'm proposing here, OK, if you, if you do this sort of problem in your class, maybe once a week or whatever, in this instance, just say, uh, you know, ask them what information they'll need here. I'm going to start with a visual. Uh, I'm going to go online and look for a visual of a, a house with a fence from the air. So I'm kind of being creepy here and moving around, stalking a little bit. And I find a house there, and I'll set it up like this. I'll, I'll come into class and say, guys, this is my house. There's my fence. It's full of holes. My kids keep escaping. I need your help. I need you to tell me, how many boards should I buy? OK? And just like that, the hook is out there in a way that's enticing and unintimidating. And now I say to them, guys, what information do I need here? What information do I need to give to you so you can help me? And now they're modeling. They're doing the process of modeling. Just that simple step there of asking them what info is important here. They start brainstorming. And do you think they won't come up with all that information from that paragraph of text? 
that in the brain trust of your classroom, they won't decide that the perimeter is important, that uh, the width of the boards is important. Some student who doesn't always analyze and perform operations perfectly is going to say, wait a second, the gap between the boards is important. And that's a special moment when we can uh, throw some love on that kid right there uh, for coming up with a, you know, what might be kind of a nitpicky, irritating suggestion under other circumstances, like, you know, get out of here. We don't need that. But no, we're building the problem together. That kid is essential. Then we have that. We uh, put the information down separately. Yeah, we need the perimeter. We can talk about how would you measure that long side there. Your textbook will just give that info, that long side there. How do you do that? Like, I have a ruler. Is that going to be effective? We can talk about the pragmatic skill of modeling. How would I measure that? I might walk it off. I don't know. Uh, take string. That's a good question to ask. Give the info. Um, send them to, to the hardware supply website. Have them price it out, whatever. That's having the kids do the second act with you. Um, and my, the last thing I try to do, and again, these five things are not things I do every day, every problem. I try to incorporate elements of them into everything I do. But we don't do modeling problems every day. But make the third act visual for reasons that we've already shown you guys. It's more convincing. It's more uh, visually engaging to see the Death Star blow up than to read about it. So if the, if the problem you're going to take on is how high up was Professor Splash when he set the world record for the tallest swan dive into a kiddie pool, if that's the question, and the students do all this work, and they get an answer out. They say, I think that's about 10 meters. I think that's about 10 meters, 10.5 meters. How do we, do we just say, like, you got it. You're right. See, the math works. I'm telling you, it works. Do we open the back of the book and say, look right there, 10.5 meters? None of which is as convincing as finding some independent authority, say, like a, a newspaper that says, check it out, 11 meters. And now the kids say, OK, all right, math works. Um, or right here, you know, this scene right here. In the next five seconds, he says the answer. Um, almost three. 32, 200 feet. That's no problem. It's about your basic 20-story high-rise. You got enough rope? We always have enough rope. That's interesting. We got the answer, number one, but also a context for the answer. Why would you want to know? If you're in a cave, why would you want to know how far down it is to the next ledge? I guess I'm imagining you have 100 feet of rope, and the cave floor, unbeknownst to you, is 200 feet down, and you start descending. When you get to the end of that rope, it's going to be a rude surprise. So here the math is useful. Uh, if you're going to ask how many people are there at that camp in the desert called Burning Man, and the students do all this work on crowd density an area on that shape that is a gift to math teachers. Let's be plain here. Like, show them the answer there instead of just saying, yeah, you guys are right, it's 50,000. Let them have that satisfaction of getting so close. Um, in this case right here, you know, the title of the YouTube video has an answer in it. Uh, YouTube user Jam Nizzle there has said that the hole is 1,500 feet, and maybe we got that answer, and so we're like, all right, great, we agree with Jam Nizzle. Or maybe, maybe we don't have the same answer, and we send someone into the comments on YouTube to ask, uh, Mr. Jam Nizzle, sir, how did you get that answer? What assumptions were you working with? Submit, and Jam Nizzle opens up a dialogue with us. And we have that conversation with Jam Nizzle. I'm trying to find one more way to bring the name Jam Nizzle into the conversation here, but I, <laughs> I just like it a lot. Anyway, so that's, that's revealing the answer. What effect does this have on students? I've, I've tried to assert and ask you to trust me that the effect is a powerful one. I've done some research uh, in my graduate studies that indicates it's a very powerful effect. Here's a student, she's an, uh, an English teacher. I've done the, the water tank math problem with her, and at this point, she has the answer 8.1 minutes written down on her page. Check this out right here. There you yeah. go. <laughs> um, I'm dying of curiosity. Is that anywhere near the right answer? Oh, yeah, we'll, show, let's, uh, we'll show you here the answer, OK? Oh, it's, no. it's sad. <laughs> wait. Wait, we wait, 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 Hey, hey. Yeah. Look, look. we were pretty close. 8.16 minutes. That's totally. Dude, high five. Yeah. Right? Like, and again, this is not scientific. Maybe she reacts that way to every math she's ever done. Close. Like, I don't know. 
I don't know, but this is a hint. This is a hint in the right direction here. Surprise, elation, all that stuff. Like, I've not seen students get that when they turn to the back of the book and say, all right, problem 11, 8.1 minutes. Next problem. It's not the same. So those are the five things I try to do. I try to pull out elements of those every day. I don't do all of those every day. I don't do these problems every day. Um, what does this all indicate? What does this recommend for my friend here, for my friend? What should we do with this? We tried to do it one way, and it didn't work. How can we do this better now? Well, let's think about the act one. What would be an act one here? What kind of image, photo, or video could I show you here that would make you wonder, uh, how long will this graduation last? What would work for you? Please. Should we do a photo, a video? Do you have any, any preference there? Why would a video be better here? For questions like how long, photos don't work so hot because they're a snapshot in time, but videos show time passing. So I'd recommend a video here. So, I mean, this is my best tried it so far. Let me know what you think. I mean, are you there? Like, do I need to keep going here? Do I need to keep playing it? Like, it took like seven seconds and already I'm over it. And I want to know how long will this last, right? Like, video is that powerful. And I can ask you guys to guess how long it'll take, given that, uh, given the crowd in the background there, that's the graduating class right there, you can guess how long it'll take. And I'll ask you, okay, guys, you had this guess down. Um, what information could we get here to find out the answer? I'm going to ask you for the Act 2 information. I'll ask you, how would you get it? In the same way uh, that she did. So what should I do here? I'm going to have you guys time off, not literally, but in the class, I'd have you guys time off a longer segment there to find the rate. And some of you would just do one name. You would time off one name, and you would have one rate. Another group would time off 30 seconds. You would have a different rate. We would all own different answers, and the math would be the same. That's wild. That's a great thing for us to have that kind of ownership over our own answers. And then to get you guys the names, the number of people there, I'm not going to just tell you there's 198 there. I won't just tell you that. I'm going to ask you, like, how would you figure this out? What would you do here? You would look at the program, as you've told me. So I made sure that I grabbed, when I was there, that I grabbed a program, and I'll go ahead and scan that thing in. I basically want to put my students in her shoes, my friend's shoes. So now they have a copy of the graduation program, and they can do the modeling. And then in Act 3, let's say they do all that work, and they get it's going to take 26 minutes to finish up. What would prove to them that it works? Here's what I have. I'm not very happy with it. Okay, I'm not thrilled with this. I timed it on my phone. Press start at the start, stop at the end, and took a screenshot. But it, if my students don't really trust me all that much, if they think I might lie to them, that could be faked. I could have faked that. Um, I think ideally it'd be like the, the water tank answer, kind of this fast motion thing. And we, just, we have a timer on it and see how fast it's going and see it that way. That'd be ideal. And graduation season's coming up, and I'm on the case. Don't worry about it. I got this. <laughs> What about a sequel, though? Some groups will finish faster than others. Some groups took a minute or two minutes to time off the rate. They're still working. This group is fast. They're done. Uh, they're setting their desks on fire. You know, like, I got to have something for them to do. So what would be a sequel problem here that would not feel like busy work, that would extend the mathematics? Um, try this one on for size. What if there were 500 people graduating instead of 190? But... They're just going to be doing the same math. They're going to drop in 500 into the same expression where they had 198, compute the math, and then they're done again and back to lighting their desk on fire. So that's not going to work. That feels like busy work. You know, that's, that's not going to work for us here. What I'll do instead is take what was known and unknown and flip them. So before we were trying to find time, time was the unknown, I'll make time the known and ask, what was that graduation like? So describe a graduation that will last four hours. It's different. Or maybe describe three graduations that will last four hours, getting to kind of this interplay between rate and the number of people there. 
how those play out. How you could have a uh, graduation with two people that would take four hours if the MC was speaking very, very slowly. Or you could have uh, uh, 500 people and it takes two minutes if an auctioneer is doing it. So that's the whole thing there. I just want, I want to line it up against that. I want to line up that experience against this right here and ask you to consider the costs and, and minuses here, the benefits and costs. There's definitely costs here. There's definitely costs to the approach I've laid out. One uh, obvious one to me is we're taking more time to do one problem. We're learning a lot more. We've lowered the bar for entry for students who typically fail at these kind of problems. But that is a cost. It takes longer. So we do fewer problems. And I don't do these problems every day. I do this kind of problem when I want to prove to students that math models their world and show them how to do it. That's when I, I bring this kind of problem out. But I think on the plus side, on the plus side, we have a situation where you, it's more fun. I hope it's obvious. Like we're guessing, we're talking about it. It's, uh, it's more fun for a lot of students who don't have fun in math class. But also, weirdly, it's more challenging. Because students are having to figure out what information do I need here? How will I get it? What will I do with it? That's more challenging. We have more fun and more challenge. And I don't know about you, that's, that's a very rare thing in a math classroom, my math classrooms anyway. More fun, we usually have more fun when challenge goes down. Like when we're doing a connect the dots jack-o'-lanterns the day after Halloween when everyone has a, a sugar coma or whatever. <laughs> or uh, you know, we're cutting out snowflakes to talk about symmetry, whatever, you know, before, before Christmas break. Like challenge goes down and fun goes up. And here I'm saying that both have gone up together, which is a very rare thing for my classes. I can't ignore that. So uh, this right here is the result of, you know, 45 minute summary of a lot of banging my head against a wall, trying to figure out why do I enjoy math so much and my students don't? Why do I have such confidence in math as a tool and my students don't think this tool is useful at all? Just banging my head against the wall, trying things that don't work, putting student names into the same old word problems, convinced they're going to love them more. <laughs> like I have tried so many things that don't work and I'm bringing to you guys the spit shined and polished version of all my failure. Okay, so I, I don't want to imply this is super easy just to start up. What I'd like to do instead is give you guys an exercise like push ups or running laps that gets you conditioned for this kind of mathematical teaching uh, if you want it. This is something that's been very useful for me. It's got me in good shape mathematically. And that's this um, you guys enjoy math if you're a math teacher, let's, let's assume that. I'm hoping that. Let's say you, you use math in your own life, either to solve problems you have or just to kind of like experience like uh, wonder, like how long will this graduation last? The next time you do that, you're in that spot where you're experiencing math, take a photo or a video of it, a short one, no more than one minute, no one's getting bored, no video you saw here was longer than a minute. Okay? You're just going to take a video or a photo of it and here's what you do with that, is you show it to somebody. No words, you just show it to somebody, uh, department, colleagues, superintendent, husband, wife, whatever, and say, what's the first question that comes to your mind when you're watching this? What's the first question that comes to mind? If any, leave room for them to be totally bored by it and not have any question. That's exceptionally valuable feedback for me, that you're bored by this. Uh, better you tell me that now than when I'm with my students and they're bored, okay? And just see what questions pop up. See if it's the same question that you were wondering. And if it's not, try to recapture that video. Um, if you have an iPhone or any kind of cell phone these days, they often have you know, photo capturing, video capturing capability on them. I can't tell you how many times I just whip the phone out and take a photo of something that I notice that provokes a question in me. And then just show it to somebody. And um, I mean like, so uh, here's a website that I've set up to facilitate this. If you don't have any friends or if you don't have a husband or wife, no one wants to talk to you, you have BO or whatever, um, I sympathize with all of that, okay? 101 QS, 101 Questions is a website I've set up that will let you get feedback on your photos and videos real easily. What it is like this, you can go there you know, right now, whenever, and what's gonna happen is you'll see, you'll see a photo or a video up there, and it's gonna ask you what's the first question that comes to mind. And you type one if, if you have one, or you skip it if you don't. Hit submit there. Like, uh, I'm wondering, uh, how many of each denomination coin is there? I hit submit. And what happens is, is that feedback goes to the person who uploaded that photo. Here's a, a picture. I don't have a question. I hit skip it. I'm bored. Skip it. I'm bored. 
Um, honestly, I could just go like that for days and days. There's some interesting stuff in there that provokes a lot of questions for me that other people, other teachers have uploaded. And that feedback's so valuable. So for instance, here's one that I wanted feedback on. I, I took this video, I wanted feedback on it. I want to know, what question do you have about it? Is it my question? Is it a different question? Here's the video, less than a minute. I want to use this video here to talk about uh, proportional figures. I want to use this as a first act. I want to ask my students, I'm going to ask them, um, how many regular bears would I have to eat to have the same stomach ache as I would eating a super bear? <laughs> like a thousand regular bears, a hundred regular bears, a million regular bears? That's the question I want to ask, but I don't know if it's just coming out of my warped, weird, mathy mind or if that's gonna perplex students also. So I upload the thing real easily. I just uh, paste a link to it, and I give it a title, say Super Bear. I type in my question, how many regular bears equals one Super Bear, and I hit upload. That's the process right there, and then it goes to that main page, and comments and questions start pouring in. Okay, other people see it, they ask their questions, they skip it if they're bored. You guys wanna see the result of this? See if it's useful? Here's uh, the page right here. It has 57 questions and 10 skips, first of all, which is, I would say, a favorable ratio compared to other stuff on there. There's some that get more, more skips than questions. I have a few of those myself on there, okay? Here's the questions that came out of those 57. Check it out. Calories, interesting, didn't think about that. Grams of sugar. Uh, is the price, is it, what would be a fair price? <laughs> Good God. Quantos mini bears is igual al super bears? Oh, that's, that's, that's my favorite there, I think. That's such a good question. Gregory's. <laughs> I don't know. I get, I get a little bit goosebumpy reading these things and, and seeing just how much smarter the internet is than me. Like how many better ways there were to pose my own question. Like that bit about if I'm, if I'm regular Greg, how big is super Greg? Like how big is the person who would eat that gummy bear, the super bear, and that would be a regular bear to that person? Like how tall is that person? Like people are giving me such valuable feedback there. I wanna offer you guys that website. It's all free there, all stuff is free. I'd love to see your guys' stuff on there and offer comments and skips or whatever, you know, that sort of thing. That site's there. There's also a top 10. Uh, we'll see, in the interest of full disclosure, here's my worst. Here's the one that has the most skips per question just really fast here. I can show you guys, I'll sort backwards by score. Yeah, target tint here has uh, almost twice as many skips as questions. It's kind of curious. I mean, the answer is not 12, you know? How many 5% tints will reach a 60% tint? The answer isn't 12. I found that kind of curious. But the internet did not agree. And so I'm, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful to know that now than before I go into a classroom with it. That's great feedback for me. Click on the top 10 if you want places to start. I mean, Super Bear is, there, is at number six right there. There's some interesting stuff on the top 10 list for you to start with if you want to. Um, there's the website, 101qs.com, 101 questions. If you want to get started with full lesson plans, I've made a lot of these, like the Super Bear and all that, uh, available to you for free. At this website, threeacts.mrmeyer.com. If you want to have a look at that. I'll give you some ideas to start with. I'll have a website up at the end of the session here that'll have all these resources combined onto one page, okay? Um, all this is an effort to, to say, classrooms are an unforgiving place to learn to teach. You know, my, my advisor at Stanford says that, I totally agree. We, we fail in our job, we learn in our job, and kids get hurt. You know, kids have a, a lousy experience. 
Uh, my first two years teaching, no doubt students have been turned on to math, turned off to math permanently because of my in-class failure. It's just a fact. It's part of the job. Um, unfortunately, so this is uh, this is a way. For, this exercise is a way for us to get good at one part of our job without hurting kids, which I like. Um, so there's that, and I'm just saying, whenever we want to prove to kids, we make these, this promise to kids that math models your world. We can show you how to use that model. We need to back that up. I don't make this claim every day, every lesson, every problem to kids, but on, on days when I'm going to try to make that case, and we do an applied math problem, ask yourself, is paper the right tool for this? Or is multimedia, a video or a photo, a better tool to make good on those promises? And honestly, this exercise, I'm, I'm off for you guys, 101 questions, people get so good at it. It's so weird. Like this right here, this is a guy's first submission. This right here, he's asking you what questions you have here. No one has any questions. It's too blurry. It's too hard to figure out what's going on here. The numbers are too abstract. I don't know what those numbers are. No one had questions. This guy now has the, the most popular photo or video on the website. This one right here. Someone says, like, it trains my eyes. This exercise of grabbing a photo or a video of math, asking people, what questions do you have here? It trains your eyes to find perplexing mathematics. Um, you, you find math more and more. It pokes in your head when you least expect it. I totally identify with this. It strikes me at inappropriate times. Like, I'm in, I'm in the bathroom, let's say, and on top of the urinal, there's a math problem, you know? <laughs> The pint saves 88% more than a one gallon urinal. I'm like, all right, like I, could, I could put a little black box over 88% and ask students like, what percent should be there if, it's, if the advertising is true. And then I'm pulling my camera out in the bathroom, you know, taking a little, <laughs> like, 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 be very careful, all right? No one get hurt on account of this presentation, all right? Or this one right here, I didn't take this one, but someone grabbed this one and posted it. This is a, I didn't know that bubble gum balls came in truck sizes. That's an awesome photo. I want to know how many bubblegum balls would fit in there. I can't help but wondering that. I want tools to figure that out. So I asked this guy, so what were the circumstances of that photo? How'd that happen? Uh, were you like, uh, you saw it pull out of a parking lot and you grabbed it? And the guy's like, no, that's not what happened. <laughs> I keep a strange set of professional heroes, and that guy is definitely on them. <laughs> Look, I mean, bottom line, we're, we, have, we are privileged ambassadors of a message that math models your world. That uh, this is a powerful tool that you can have that will solve problems that you want to solve. It's a privileged position we have to carry that promise to students, and we've got to make good on it. It's a privileged job we have. It's been a privilege talking with you guys. Thank you.